Hey, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you listen to the podcast. I'm Sherry Dutter, and you're here at the Writing Glitch Hacking Dysgraphia, No Pencil Required. Today, we're coming to you from Central Time Zone, some from Texas and Pennsylvania, where we have a retired Lieutenant Colonel joining us, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike, who has written a book and tells a story a little bit about a journey with learning disability. And I just want to say thank you for your service and uh, sharing a little bit about your uh, journey in life through this book. So how are you today, really, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike? Yeah, I'm in San Antonio, Texas, and it's cool and clear here. And uh, we had a really rough summer, but I'm doing pretty good. And uh, yeah, like I said, I did 31 years and with a learning disability, which may have caused me some problems throughout the time. But uh, yeah, we can get into those stories. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And before we get started, I'm just going to remind everybody that this episode is sponsored by Dutter Educational Consulting. We have a course on dysgraphia. Uh, and by getting certified, you will uh, be able to uh, share dysgraphia with the other teachers in your school, or you could be a parent or a therapist as well. Everyone has learned from this, and it really teaches you how to create a universal design program around kids who are struggling with writing. To find more about that course, you can go to sherry.org.com. Look for the calendar link and uh, look for our next webinar, which usually is the second uh, Wednesday of the month. So without further ado, tell us, Jason, what inspired you to write this book? Um, My daddy was a storyteller and he told stories all the time. And Mm -hmm. so I had a whole lot of stories that were on my mind and, uh, I just didn't know how to put it out. I've never wrote a book in my life. I don't know how to market a book. I mean, I I failed English. I mean, English writing are definitely my worst subjects. And that was where my learning disability was identified. And I thought, well, I wanted to put this out there for a healing mechanism for myself and to uh, get the stories down on paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Sounds very familiar. That's exactly (laughs) why I wrote my first book was to really attack the areas of weakness that I felt that I had. And and now I'm also podcasting, which is my second fear, and that was public speaking. And here I am. Yep. <laughs> exactly. I have an audio book out too for folks who don't know like don't like to read too well and want to listen. So it's in my voice. So I'm the narrator and the author of the first book which is A Soldier Against All Odds. That's the juicy book. Uh, that's where I talk about my learning problems and things. Uh, that's And I got a second book out more for veteran self-help guide. It's more of a guide for uh, getting your benefits in the military, but uh, out of the uniform and uh, back into civilian life. But yeah, so I'm 58 years old, but at the in 1972, when I was about six years old, seven years old, I failed the first grade. Um, English and writing were my worst subjects. There was no doubt on that. And it struggled. I struggled with reading and writing all my life and understanding things, even simple instructions that are just, you know. So um, I wanted to put that out there. I think just graduating from a college, according to my family and friends, was sort of a miracle of its own. Um, And I have a whole chapter in there titled, where there's a wheel, there's an A, like the letter A. And I have a lot of techniques on studying and doing things and techniques I used to get through school and other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Can you elaborate on a couple of those techniques? Yes. Okay. So repeating. So Three by five cards are wonderful. They give brevity to what you need to know in a classroom. And so I would write down little notes uh, and write down what was important from the class. And when I was in the when I was in a classroom, I would sit towards the the at the at the beginning, right when you come in, I would sit towards the teacher 
because it shows interest. You're physically there. You're less distracted. That's one thing I would do. I would use a tape recorder. And if if I had any issues, I would I would tape record. I would listen to it again. I used animal technique of learning and a way of the senses, the food, the taste, the smell, the hearing. And sometimes I would put my fingers on the sheet of paper or I would read and talk aloud. And then if I could do at the same time, I might drink some tea or some coffee or some food and I would get the senses involved with the learning process. And I and I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't study too long, maybe only 10 minutes to 15 minutes, take a break. Take a five, 10 minute break. I would never cram. I'd always take my time, just like you know, you're working out with muscle and you're trying to build weights. You you have to, you know, it just doesn't, you have to take your time with it. And so I would do that. And uh it was more of a slow, methodical process. I don't ever, I didn't ever cram for anything. And uh, and so I would just uh plan ahead all. I did a lot of planning ahead. I learned how. In the book, I have the five P's, prior planning prevents poor performance. And they would say, Pikes, my last name is Pike, Pikes doing the five P's. And I would I would plan in advance. And I'm, I'm pretty good on that. I'm pretty good on a calendar, pretty good at looking out and seeing what I need to do to get to that objective. So I have a whole lot of good techniques on there. And a lot of people think, well, I don't have no time to study. I don't have time to study. You have to drive a lot, a lot of, well, and then you have to drive to class. You have to drive back. You got to drive to work. Well, those recording devices, even in the 80s, are, I would I'd get a little tape recorder and I would just listen. Um, and I would listen to myself talk or the teacher talk. And that wouldn't be another way of using my, and I use my time wisely. Um, yeah, so I've got that chapter in there. Now, see, where there's a will, there's an A. I kind of, I got that from a tape from the 80s, um, from the 1980s, a long time ago. They had, it's just basically, most educators probably know they just study techniques that I didn't have. And I needed, I, I was one of those people that really needed that. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know. So you learned your study techniques by listening to others share study techniques. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what I, I I didn't pick it up in a high school on the techniques. Uh, I I I pretty much had to get a tape before going to college and then apply it, apply that tape. Just the and it, you you may have many many techniques out there, um, but some people may only pick up a few things that are good for them. And uh, but you give the whole you you show them the whole toolbox and then allow them to take the tools or practice with tools that work for them. And I just, you know, those are just a few of them that worked for me, but there may be a bigger toolbox out there that they can use and and, and take from. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I, I, I may have had dyslexia that the, the term dyslexia in the seventies was thrown around. I, for me, I just knew that I was a slow learner, a slow, well, there was a whole lot of tests on me. And at the end of the day, yeah, I want a slow processor. I need if you can give me preparation, but also give me two hundred percent extra time, like maybe twice the amount of time for me to process it. I'm better. Um, I'm better off. So they they sent me when I failed the first grade in uh, Georgia, in there, Atlanta, Georgia. They sent me to Emory University, and there was up in the seventies. It was a whole battery of tests. I probably should have gone because uh, I do remember that I, I still got the paperwork. I should have gone to an educational writing center at a young age, and that may have helped me. But um, they, they decided just to not say anything about it. It was a time when you didn't say anything about it. And uh, that's what we just said. It was just let him just let him go on just when, instead of going through any specialist. But that's that's kind of how that was set up. And uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So did you join military first or did you go to college first? I went to the military first because college and convention, the high school counselors and the test scores, uh, there was no way uh, there was no way I was going to go to college with my, with my SAT scores and things of that nature. And the high school counselor saying there don't even go. So I and, and it wasn't a disappointment. I kind of knew about it from the first grade. And uh, so I went to I went into the army at the age of 17. I was still in high school. I did not have a high school diploma because I had failed the first grade. And um, 
So when, and it was a reserve force. So I came back into 12th grade high school with, with, with already a whole lot of training in the military done already through that summer. Uh, I did three months. So between my junior and senior year. And so I went there first. And when I came out and when I graduated, bottom line short, I, it was a hard time for me to, to be able to get through that. But when I got through that, I had developed a whole lot of self-confidence. That's where I thought I could do a whole lot more at the young age of 18. I just didn't know how I was going to do it because I'm sitting here thinking, I just went through all this and I think I can do a whole lot more. And even though the counselors and the teachers say I can't, I feel that I can. And I don't know how I'm going to do it. And, and But eventually I did go to college. I got two master's degrees and a bachelor's degree. What I did is I had to go to a junior college first uh, where they would take pretty much anybody, and then prove myself, gain my academic confidence, go slower, and then transfer into a major university and graduate and then go on from there. But um, yeah, that's, yeah, I was more scared of going into a college classroom than jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. And I've done both. <laughs> so so uh, that kind of shows you how, where I was coming from at that time. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm not jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> Not, not, not on my own free will. <laughs> oh, so I see this path and I want uh, to pause here and, and have our listeners reflect that you knew as a young first grade student, your parents knew as well that you were struggling. They engaged you in the regular curriculum. They didn't give you accommodations. Uh, you and I are around the same age. We didn't have those things at that time anyway. And so you struggled, you struggled, you struggled. You make me think of one of my first students who told me when he was in kindergarten, I'm going into the military. And he went to these summer cadet programs all through high school. And he ended up joining the military and that's where he is now. Cool. Um, and he had reading trouble. He had writing trouble. He had speech trouble. He had math trouble. Like everything was hitting this poor kid. Compound that with autism to uh. boot. So he had social anxiety and he really is in a different place through the lessons that he learned through the military and going through cadet school. He was definitely a different kid in high school than he was in kindergarten. Mm, wow. I imagine you were the same. Well, I did not go through all the cadet schools that he did, um, but I was pretty, pretty much baptized in the very beginning at the age of 17 in the military. That's where it was. Everything was thrown at me. And then more of my self-confidence got together uh, after that experience. And then I stayed with the military in some form or fashion for the next 31 years. It was, it was the reserves. And then I transferred over, but um, it was, it would be similar. Um, it would be similar. Uh, I had also a osteomyelitis. I had a physical def uh, deformity. Well, a disease, osteomyelitis on my left knee. So I had some physical ailments I had to work through as well. Um, socially. You in the military? That's a good question. And a good question is, how did they get me into the military with a physical problem? And also, there's an entrance exam. I definitely know I could not have passed that entrance exam if they didn't slide me in. On the entrance exam, I feel since I was joining the reserves and they needed bodies, they just threw me in. Now, on the physical part, I lied to him and I said, hey, I'm fine. This was before the Internet. And when you had to check the boxes and sign off that you're fine. And I did. And I worked on my legs uh, to get them strong. So, yes, exactly. I, I, I'm more surprised that he let me in on the academic side than the physical side because I had worked up on that because I had that physical problem when I was nine, the bone disease. But my academic problem stayed with me all my pretty much. I had to. I, I, I developed compensation strategies. Uh, I became creative on how to accomplish things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I, li I like that you were using note cards. Uh, but I also 
initially thought you had come up with that strategy on your own. Then you later had said that you learned other strategies along the way from other experts. Who would you say is one of the experts that is a go-to for you? For a go-to for... uh, Or learning how to study or... and. Like who? Who? What kind of? Uh, what kind of authors do you like to read about? Well, there, really, I I stuck with the basics of a tape, and it may be a book out now on where there's a will, there's an A. Uh, they it was John Ritter who was a commercial guy, guy from maybe an actor from years ago. He initially did Are the you tape. Talking about John Ritter from Three's Company or a different John yeah. Ritter. That's the same guy from three. Okay. So, yeah. so he had a tape out in the eight. I think he's passed away now, but, and he had a tape where there's a will, there's an A. And I just sat down and looked at it. And there was a whole lot of techniques he did on how to study. And I just picked up the ones that I knew sitting in front of the class. Uh, yeah. The note takes it also brevity and then reviewing your notes um, just right after the class. Uh for only five minutes. And I just applied those things and used my time wisely. I, for the most part, I'm pretty good with it. I've got to, uh, um, I'm, I don't need to go back because uh, I've stuck with, I got two masters and I applied that to them. And so I've got a lot of repetition down and I sort of know well, kind of what to do and how to do it. And recording uh, definitely helps me a lot as well, just because I might want to go back and review something. and. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I, yeah. And I, you know, so yeah, that's kind of where I go to was with him. And I just practice it, practice it, practice it. Once I, I learned, once I practice something a lot, I'm pretty darn good with it. Probably better than most. Um, but it's it's just harder for me to hit that threshold to get it. Like, for example, changing a tire. If I didn't know how to change a tire of a car, most of you, folks, your audiences would do it much, much better than me. But with me, after I learned it, which would take harder to do, I would be doing it better and faster than you did. That's just kind of how my my process mechanism works, but it takes me a little bit more effort. And when I do it, it's really, I'm I'm pretty good with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I had a thought, oh gosh. Okay, so that's what happens when these things are videotaped live is you have these thoughts that are going on in your head and then they they flee away. Um, what advice do you have for parents, for kids who have either reading, writing, or math trouble? Do you, what, what advice do you have for that, that parent that's out there? Your parents approached it keep them in the regular curriculum, what would you say today? Well, first of all, don't label them. Don't put them down. Don't criticize them at all. Mine didn't. My, there was a few times, but let allow them the space and the time uh, that they need to do. Uh, if you can afford a specialist or someone on the outside, or maybe someone that's a tutor that can come into your home or wherever is a safe place, Allow that to happen if that can happen. Um, if, uh, if you can't afford it, maybe extra time after school with some folks, um, but allow them to have the space and allow them to grow. And I thought, I think my parents did it pretty well. They just allowed me to grow. That Well, they didn't have any expectations on me. Uh, they didn't expect me at all. Other kids, other of my siblings, they had expectations and for me, uh, the liberating time was just allowing, I just said, well, just let him go in a way that's bad. I'm saying you know, there's no expectations. But for me, it was a way for me to develop and uh, without any restraints. So I, and that's that's what I thought it was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So your parents did give you the space that you needed to learn. You mm-hmm. found a person to focus on their techniques and utilize their techniques. There are so many people out there that are sharing techniques on improving memory um, today. But it's interesting that you talked about John Ritter um, because him being an actor, he needed to be able to learn how to immerse himself into that role, repeating it, repeating it, hearing it auditory. I know what I was going to say earlier is 
my reading comprehension has gotten much better now that I am listening and have Audible so I can listen to the books. I can see it and I can read it and they're Mm -hmm. synced together. I'm comprehending better than I ever did when I was in high school. So that's another thing that with kids with disabilities, there's things like Learning Ally and and other resources out there that kids with disabilities can get free audio versions of books. There's also a lot of their textbooks. You can create an audio, they have audio versions. So as I'm reflecting upon what you're saying, I'm also trying to relate it back to the, the kids and what parents can do to access today. Um, so I appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you for your service. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to today's uh, conversation? Not really, other than the, the book, uh, Soldier Against All Odds, is, is about a guy who had a learning problem and a lot of problems who made it through 31 years it's on Audible Audio. You can get me through jasonpike.org, jasonpike.org. The two books are there and inspirational things as well. It's on Amazon as well. But really, it's it's a survival. I, I survived and every I defied a lot of odds um, and learning disabilities was one of them. So, but yeah, that's basically what I got for you. Mm-hmm. Mm, lovely. This has been Sherry Dutter from the Writing Glitch Podcast. We publish this, these episodes on the second and Tuesday of every month. So I look forward to seeing you at the next episode. Do me a favor, write a review, subscribe to the podcast. And if you want to hear any uh, uh, um, any interventions, we do master classes once a month. So look on my website for those. Remember, you were put here for such a time as this. And thank you for Sam C Productions for doing the post-production of this podcast.